Hello everyone and welcome to Quick Med, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we will be discussing the types of heparin from unfractionated heparin to low molecular weight heparin, as well as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, so let's get to it. Alright, before we get started, let's talk about the different types of heparin. So it's important to know that the word heparin is really an umbrella term that refers to different types, so it can be a little bit confusing when people just use the word heparin. The term heparin specifically can refer to one of three forms, your unfractionated heparin, your low molecular weight heparin, which includes your anoxaparin and your deltaparin, as well as fondaparinox, which is actually more of a synthetic heparinoid, but it's often lumped under heparin, so we're going to include it here as well. To get a better understanding of how heparin works, we need to understand the coagulation cascade. So this is a very bare bones overview of the coagulation cascade, so if you are looking for more detail, please look at some other sources. So first we start with factors 12. 11, and 9. And if you notice, we actually skipped 10 here because 10 is part of the con pathway, which is further down. Factors 12, 11, and 9 are included in the intrinsic pathway, which is often measured by our PTT value. We also have factor 7, which is part of the extrinsic pathway, and this is often measured by the PT value. And then factor 10 is the beginning of our common pathway, which is where the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways meet. This pathway consists of factors 10, 5, and 2, and you can remember this as 10 divided by 5 will give you 2, and then we get our final product, which is fibrin. So how does heparin affect this coagulation cascade? This is where we need to look at antithrombin, which is an endogenous anticoagulant, and heparin here actually enhances the effect of antithrombin. Antithrombin inhibits factors 2 and 10 primarily, and this is where we can differentiate between the two because unfractionated heparin affects 2 and 10, whereas low molecular weight heparin predominantly affects factor 10. And the way that you can think about this is that unfractionated heparin is a longer structure than low molecular weight heparin. And this longer structure is what is required to allow for the interaction between antithrombin as well as factor 2. So let's take a look at our coagulation cascade again. As we said, both unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin inhibit factor 10, which is circled here. But if we take a closer look at unfractionated heparin, we can see that it actually inhibits a few other factors as well. These factors include 12, 11, 9, 2, as we've mentioned before, as well as factor 7. Now, if you're taking a look at this, you might be thinking unfractionated heparin is affecting pretty much the factors involved in the intrinsic pathway, and that is actually correct. This is the reason why we often use PTT to measure unfractionated heparin in the body. It's actually the most common lab value that we use to measure unfractionated heparin activity. Now, besides the different factors that they inhibit, there are actually some other differences that you need to know between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin. Unfractionated heparin can be given in two forms, an IV form as well as a subcutaneous form, which is given in the form of an injection. In comparison, low molecular weight heparin is only given in a sub-Q form. When compared with low molecular weight heparin, unfractionated heparin has a much higher risk of HIT associated with it, or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Unfractionated heparin also does have an unpredictable dose response, and so it requires frequent monitoring, whereas with low molecular weight heparin, we have a more predictable dose response, so we can often just rely on weight-based dosing and go from there. Another thing to know about unfractionated heparin is that it has a shorter half-life when compared with low molecular weight heparin. And this is helpful because we can often use unfractionated heparin in patients at a higher risk of bleeding because it has a more of a quick on and off sort of action. And now when we discuss heparin, we have to discuss a phenomenon known as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which as the name applies is when you see a platelet drop after giving heparin. And what happens here is that heparin binds to platelet factor 4, which is produced by platelets. The body views this heparin PFT complex as foreign and produces autoantibodies against this. This antibody then binds to this complex, leading to platelet aggregation and consumption on a pathologic level. And when we talk about HIT, it's important to know about two different types. Type 1 is your benign, non-immune mediated type, and so this does not involve those antibodies that we discussed earlier. Instead, it's more of a self-limited response that we see to heparin administration because there is still some sort of interaction between the heparin and platelet molecules. This typically occurs within the first four days of heparin administration, and the platelet drop here is going to be less than 50% of what the platelet count was prior to heparin administration. And the nadir here, or the lowest value that we will see, is still going to be above 100,000 in these cases. Now let's compare this to type 2, which is your pathologic immune-mediated type. This typically occurs 5 to 10 days after heparin administration, and the timing is key to know here. And because this is our more pathologic type, the platelet drop is going to be greater, so greater than 50%. And the nadir here can be pretty low, but it will still be greater than 20,000, because when 
the platelet count drops to below 20,000, we might need to consider other types of thrombocytopenias. And when we talk about HIT, particularly type 2, we're talking about something that can be potentially lethal to a patient because of the complications that you get. In particular, you can have arterial and venous thrombosis with type 2, and it's important to know that you can get both types, both arterial and venous, with arterial being a little bit more common, actually. And so in this case, we would want to avoid all heparin products, and we typically will administer direct thrombin inhibitors in this case. All right, everyone, I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe so that we can get that feedback. And if you have any questions, leave them down below. As always, good luck studying, everyone.